Let's look at some good news today, World Food Day 2013. For productive farms, we need water. The architects of the Green Revolution in Asia understood this well, and the success of high-yielding crops like rice, wheat and maize was underpinned by a heavy reliance on irrigation. But many of these new farming systems were extremely thirsty. Huge quantities of water were drawn from rivers and reserves underground. Sustainability was a secondary concern. Now we have to deal with the reality of competing demands on those water sources. We're being challenged to allocate enough water to keep producing those revolutionary crops and many of the others we need for a varied, nutritious diet. And at the same time, allocate more to fast expanding cities and industrial areas. We expect climate change will compound the problem. Rainfall patterns are changing. Droughts and floods are expected to become more intense and more frequent. Rising temperatures mean many, many crops could become even thirstier. All of this means that today, in order to have a meaningful discussion about food security, about human nutrition and about livelihoods, it's critical that we pay very close attention to water and all its uses. Now for some good news. Firstly, when it comes to feeding the 870 million hungry people in the world, we have enough water to do it, and to do it sustainably. We even have enough to feed the projected world population of 9 billion people by 2050. Access, sustainability and productivity of water use are the issues we need to tackle. But this requires a fundamental shift in the way we think about farming and natural resources management to take into account the complex ecosystems that provide water and support food production, biodiversity and societies themselves. This requires a landscape approach. Key to this will be sustainable irrigation. We already know that if smallholder farmers switch from depending solely on seasonal or unreliable rains to irrigation, they can double yields. Yet in sub-Saharan Africa, where one person in every four is malnourished, only 4% of arable land is equipped for irrigation. The potential for boosting food production through targeted supplementary irrigation is enormous, not least because parts of the region have vast natural underground reservoirs to draw on. But this, of course, will require investment in pumps and pipes, channels and canals to get that water to their crops. And it will need appropriate management systems and policies to ensure the water, whether from rain, rivers or aquifers, is stored and used efficiently and sustainably. As well as helping to tackle hunger and malnutrition, it could turn Africa into a model for sustainable agriculture. And that's my second piece of good news. So what about those areas where water for irrigation is in short supply? Since the start of this message, 10 new tube wells have been sunk in India by farmers searching for water. By the start of the Global Landscapes Forum at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Poland next month, there will be nearly 8,000 new tube wells. In the state of Gujarat, for instance, over-exploitation of groundwater has led to a rapid depletion of aquifers, but a simple change in water management policy, informed in part by research undertaken by IMI and its partners, has turned the situation around. Agricultural production is up, and so are the levels of the water table. And that's a third piece of good news. Creative responses and smarter water management can and do deliver sustainable growth. Another major issue is that millions of chronically malnourished people live in regions that swing between periods of drought and flooding. This makes food production precarious, life hard and the future uncertain. We also know that droughts and floods this year will cause around $165 billion of damage. With climate change, these costs will almost triple by 2050. So rather than dwelling on that prospect, I'd like to look at ways to reduce the risk. Which brings me on to my fourth piece of good news. There's a chance we can find new ways to reduce the scale of destructive floods. New research is underway to intercept and store water underground during times of heavy rain for farmers to use when the pendulum swings back to drought. While it's still a highly theoretical big idea, underground taming of floods could be 10 times cheaper than the cost of cleanups after disaster strikes. Finally, for now, we need to rethink the idea of wastewater, particularly household sewage. In some places, business models are being developed to process this into safe and nutritious fertilizer for crops, helping to close a major, ga major gap in the nutrient cycle, as well as reducing dependence on chemical fertilizers and reducing the pollution caused by the dumping of sewage into rivers. Everyone benefits, farmers, 
consumers and ecosystems. That means more, safer food now and in the future. These are just a few examples of interventions that could have a profound effect on food production and the sustainable management of natural resources. But of course, we need many more. We have to think big and we have to think small. We have to think inside and outside the box. We need to find more ways to ensure food crops flourish while conserving the integrity of the landscapes and ecosystems that support them and us. And of course, we have to ensure governments, policymakers, donors and farmers, particularly women and those from marginalised groups, are all involved in shaping and fine-tuning a portfolio of solutions. If we can do that, there will certainly be more good news to come. I'm Jeremy Bird of the International Water Management Institute. Thank you.